Good afternoon or good morning to everybody, depending on where you are. And uh, welcome to um, the 2022 Scientific Seminar of Genre Mekong. To those who are joining us uh, uh, just today, uh, welcome. And to those who were here yesterday, welcome back. Um, we have uh, another very nice lineup of uh, uh, talks for the next uh, um, uh, three hours. And, um, but before we do that, uh, perhaps I should summarize uh, in brief what we talked about yesterday. So um, we had uh, some very good, um, uh, very good talks by uh, the control programs of Vietnam and of Cambodia. Both countries have reported a uh, rather dramatic fall in the number of cases, particularly falciparum, but, but actually also, uh, also viva cases. So there's been great progress towards elimination. Um, I think it was said that we are not too certain um, as to whether some of this effect um, has, to, has also to do with uh, 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 with COVID and Dr. Quang from Vietnam did mention that there has been a sort of repurposing of manpower away from the forest and towards other types of industries. So it could well be that uh, our job is still not quite done. And, uh, you know, we are, we, are, we are looking forward to doing more surveillance in the future. Um, over the last few years, we have switched away from the wide use of the HAP paraquin to other types of uh, um, uh, artemisinin combination therapy, notably mostly in uh, mostly Pyramax, uh, Pyronaridin, and uh, Artesunate in uh, in Vietnam, and Artesunate mefloquine in uh, Cambodia. In both cases, it appears that uh, they work they work well, although. We probably still want some more efficacy data from what we've seen. Um, but interestingly, there's no reported increase of MDR1 copy number, which is very good news uh, because, of, um, because of the use of mefloquine. Um, we've heard from Okru, from Dr. Nguyen, that uh, a, a fully working spot malaria lab is now implemented. And uh, this was no uh, easy task because uh, of the pandemic, because of uh, lack of uh, uh, traveling, because of difficulties in conducting the, the trainings. So, uh, you know, well done. And we're really looking forward to doing more work in the region um, in, uh, in surveillance, and, but also in discovery of new markers and other related uh, activities. Um, we still have several uh, use cases, several requirements that moving forward, we would like to implement for genetic surveillance. So we did, we, I just mentioned markers of resistance for new drugs that seem to be uh, on, uh, on many people's minds, um, but also tracking resistance strains, um, which, which has been, uh, uh, which we'll hear more about today uh, when we talk about outbreaks and um, and and, and, and uh, tracking where these strains are coming from and where they're going. In addition, the, the idea of distinguishing relapses from uh, uh, recrudescences uh, is, um, uh, is, of course, very important for those who are looking at, uh, um, at Plasmodium vivax, and we'll hear more about that species uh, this afternoon. Um, and finally, we, we heard a session about using genetic barcodes, which we are able to do quite simply with uh, amplicon sequencing without having to do the sort of much more demanding task of whole genome sequencing. And of course, they cannot do everything that whole genome sequencing does, which is what we saw in that wonderful presentation by Roberto Mato about uh, the, the spread of uh, artemisinin resistance, but they can do quite a lot in order for us to identify strains, to track them, and to explain outbreaks. So we'll hear more about that today. Uh, and talking of today, um, 
we, uh, I'd like to just uh, briefly cover uh, what, um, what the topics are. Uh, the first, se the first um, um, session of today will be the, about the investigation of outbreaks into, uh, in, in, um, in southern Laos. So this has been uh, a bit of the event of the year, given that everywhere else we've had the, uh, a big drop in the number of cases. One province of Laos has been uh, sort of countering this tendency. And what we like to do is to investigate a bit further. And hopefully that will show you the power of the genetic barcodes and of uh, analyzing data beyond just genetic resistance markers. And our final sessions will be more about some perspectives for the future of our surveillance, both in the case of Plasmodium falciparum and uh, also uh, in the case of Plasmodium vivax. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us um, in that session, um, uh, Dr. Lucas Amengaitego from the University of Ghana, who's going to tell us also what is happening in Africa um, in uh, General Mekong's sister projects. Um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to that. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass on the, se the session control to Aria, uh, who will introduce ses session, session three. Okay, thank you, Professor yes, thank you. Or, So we'll come back to our scientific forum for the day two. So today we will begin with the session three in the investigation into outbreaks of emerging multi-drug resistant malaria in Laos. So we will know the more in the situation of malaria in Laos and also how we use the genetic surveillance to support the uh, outbreak investigation and collectivization of the outbreak in the South Lao, especially in the Atapu province. So first speaker will be Dr. Kiao Wopapong. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of Center of Malaliology, uh, Parasitology uh, and Etymology from the Ministry of Health in Vientiane in Laos. So now uh, I will give the floor to, the, uh, to Dr. Kiao. Could you please uh, uh, Proceed on your presentation, Dr. Gao, please. Okay, okay. good afternoon or good uh, morning, some, someone. And I am Gao Hopon Chidang Sa from Simpe Lao PDR. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to attend this meeting. And can I would like to share. Uh, some data for my country to, and to uh, everybody uh, to, to join this. Today we, we will discuss about the uh, genetic surveillance of malaria parasite in the, my country. This is our outline. We have uh, five outlines. Yes. Next. Okay, I would like to introduce the national strategy plan in my country from uh, 2021-2025. Like uh, 2023, we would like to eliminate uh, the transmission of uh, fancy forum in the country, entry country. And second, 2025, elimination of uh, YVAC. And uh, third, 2030, uh, malaria fee in my country. Yes, next slide. Yes. Uh, this slide to show the malaria trend from 2012 to 2021. Like uh, you, you see the 2012, the malaria case uh, uh, is go down uh, year by year, but uh, 2014, the malaria case is in key. This is uh, like the outbreak in the Savannah case. And then uh, from 2014, uh, malaria case go down year by year, but in 2021, malaria case in is compared to uh, 2020. This is an uh, outbreak in uh, uh, Savannah Cape and uh, Atapu. 
Yes. Next slide, please. This slide will show the malaria case compared to 2020 and 2021. Uh, you, you can see the malaria case, the positive or uh, species Vivec or fancy from 2021 on its increase if compared to 2020. And then malaria species like a Vivec more than fancy parom. And then uh, for the case, uh, female less than male, and then we have the malaria day one case in the 2021. Yes. For this slide, we show the malaria case only fancy parom. Now we have our uh, travel provinces have the uh, fancy parom case, and then now we have a uh, accelerate uh, strategy PF, and now my team. Uh, go to in view to uh, implementation uh, for TDA and uh, we use uh, areas five provinces, uh, seven districts and 60 village to implement the TDA round one and next month we move to uh, round two and the drug of choice we select the pyramid. Yes. For the monitoring the efficacy in 2021, we have the three sentinel signs. The first, Savannah Kate, and second, Sekong, and the third, uh, Atapu. Uh, why we select the three signs? This because uh, three signs like the moderate and high transmission, and then the three signs is the East Southern Park of Lao, and some province have the outbreak. And then we will take to uh, we conduct the TES in the uh, southern part of Lao. But for the northern part of Lao, we do IDS. It means uh, I do IDS uh, integrate the efficacy surveillance. We integrate to the surveillance like the 137. We follow up uh, the patient uh, how to how how to calculate the uh, curates or good efficacy or not for the uh, eliminate area. But for the TAS in the Southern Park of Lao, we, we have the uh, patient to recruit uh, and then follow up. Yes, next slide, please. This is a list now for uh, monitoring the efficacy in 2016, 2019. The first, uh, the HAP Perakin, uh, the cure is only 56%, and then uh, delay parasite clearing time, like a day three positive, uh, more than 20. And second, ASMQ and Piramac, the cure is high, 100%, and then the day three positive. Uh, less than 10 percent. Yes. Uh, this list now from 2019-2020. We have the three style uh, conduct AL. Our uh, first style Savannah Kate. The Q rate only 96 percent, and then we have the reinfection three case, but uh, two style uh, Q rate 100 percent for the VIVAC almost. Uh, High efficacy, 100% for the T side. For in 2021 and 2022, we conduct AL also in T side, like the I present previous, uh, Savannah Kate, Sekong, and Atapu. Now we are ongoing. Yes. And this for molecular marker is now 2016 and 2020. Like you see, uh, almost uh, mainly uh, C five eight zero Y. This number one is a uh, province, and second R five T nine three, and almost like you see, Champasa, occur drug resistant and uh, resistant uh, mefloquine, resistant piperacin. Yes. Next slide, please. 
for our conclusion, according to the result of TS and partner result for Moru or Institute Pasteur de Lau, the policy maker are decide to update the national malaria treatment guideline. Our first line is uh, uh, AL because uh, AL is high therapeutic efficacy stuff efficacy and then for the certain line for that policy the WSO recommendation we can use ACT and then we do the pilot ASMQ and pyramid is high and then now uh, national treatment guideline we update ASMQ and pyramid like a circle line and for the we have a people again uh, the Q rate very low, and then uh, the policy in, in my country is like a reject. Uh, no, no need to use, yes. And this, uh, uh, for the most of our K13 mutation, mainly is the C5X0Y and second R539T in Champasak and Salavan. Uh, and then this year, we uh, conduct the TES more in Atapu, and then we are waiting the this sound, uh, but uh, now we, we not yet, and we expect about uh, May or June uh, to know the result for uh, Atapu and uh, Savanake, because uh, like uh, you know, in 2021, uh, we have the outbreak in the two provinces. And the uh, last, in 2019 and 2021, uh, we, we found the partner that like the Lui function because until now the AL, we, we know the active missing resistance already, but now we, 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 we don't know the Lui Mei function resistance or not. And then uh, the, the sample cannot send to uh, uh, Pastor Du Cambodia, because uh, the COVID situation, and then we we are waiting for the send the sample to uh, Cambodia. We not get the result uh, for the Lume function. Yes, this is my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, hello, Dr. Dr. Kale. Kale. Um, yes, thank, thank you very, very much for your presentation. presentation. That was great. Uh, since we have a couple of minutes uh, spare here, I wanted to ask you. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, on uh, on the slide before last, you you seem to be saying there's a, there's a high proportion of uh, MDR one. Um, what what do you mean by that? Uh, do you mean MDR one copy number or mutations? What what um, what does that uh, slide say? Uh, go back to my slides. Go back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this slide, yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Uh. Uh. For, for our TES, we would like to analyze the first uh, uh, the first uh, we would like to know the uh, treatment failure and second we would like to know the if the uh, parasite come back liquid stung or infection and the third we want to know the actinicinilase stung or not and we found uh, like a, how to say pepsin right. Hello. Right. Yes. Yes. And the, the last, we, we want to know the partner that uh, the, the efficacy is good or not. Is this uh, uh, our TES to, to, to analyze? Yes. Okay. So the MDR1 percentages, so I see 59.5. Uh, yes. um, for 75 here. What's what are you referring to there? Is this MDR1 
uh, copy number or MDR1 mutations? What did you measure? Mm, I cannot explain for this, but, but uh, when uh, my team sent the list out to me, uh, not copy number, not copy number. Oh, okay, okay. That makes more sense because uh, what I was going to say is we did not find so many amplifications in Laos. So I was a bit surprised to see this, but maybe they only look at mutations. Then this is, yeah, yeah. This is more, uh, more expected. Yeah. Yeah, mutation, not, not copy number. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gao. A uh, very nice presentation, and and so we know more about the situation of malaria in Laos, and and about the drug resistant malaria in Laos. So, uh, I will go to the next topic that uh we give by Dr. Walanya Wasukun. She is a uh, a research uh, scientist in uh, our project. So she will give the story about the genetic analysis of Maria outbreak in the southern Laos that we got the information that there are the outbreak in the Atapur province. So she will provide more information on the genetic analysis of this group of parasites. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Waranya, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Aria. Um, in the talks by Professor Olivo and Dr. Aria yesterday, they have presented how the genetic surveillance was used in monitoring resistance markers and tracking the spread of resistance strains. And in this talk today, I will present another use case that genetic surveillance can deliver. It's the outbreak characterization use case, which we um, demonstrated in Laos. I hope that by the end of the talk, you will see how we can use genetic surveillance to discriminate between different outbreak drivers. In the past years, overall, we have a big reduction in uh, falciparum malaria cases in Laos. However, in a few isolated pockets of Laos, there have been some outbreaks. Um, during the 2020 to 2021 malaria season, at the province in southern Laos experienced an unusual increase in the number of Plasmodium falciparum cases. The National Malaria Program in Laos, whom we worked with in genetic surveillance, has asked us to investigate into the Atapura outbreak um, to see whether this outbreak has to do with drug resistance or was there a different factors that is uh, driving the outbreak, like increased vector activity or human activity, for instance. And just like many projects, it is uh, the network of collaboration between partners that facilitates this investigation. So it started with SEMPE, the National Malaria Control Program in Laos, noticed the unusual increase in cases and requested Jen Red Mekong to investigate and determine the cause. Samples were then uh, collected by Romru and processed by Sanger Institute and analyzed by Jen Ray. So how can we use uh, genetic epidemiology to investigate the outbreak? Was the increase in transmission a result of more bites from infected mosquitoes? Or was there a selection of a, of a strain for some phenotypic trait like resistance to drug? One indication that we can use to help us determine the outbreak driver is to analyze the diversity profile of the population. And this can be measured using um, genetic barcodes. If we see normal diversity in the outbreak population, it indicates that the increased transmission is without selection. Whereas if we see lower diversity, it indicates a probable ongoing selection of a parasite population. Uh, in addition to this, um, we also analyzed the genetic markers of drug resistance and compared that to other periods. 
Um, before I move on to show you the findings, I want to quickly show how drug resistance can affect uh, diversity. So here we have normal diversity, um, then a new mutation that makes the parasite resistant to the anti-malarial in use arises, which mean uh, they would be able to survive the anti-malaria induced. So the parasite with the new mutation multiplies and thrive, whereas other parasites are killed off by the drug, so the number stayed low. The new mutation rises rapidly in frequency and the overall uh, population diversity decreases. If you were here yesterday, you would have heard the explanation about genetic barcodes. So I'm not going to go into details, but just to say that genetic barcode is like a summary of the genome. It can tell us how similar the parasites are to one another. For instance, if we have high mismatches in the barcode, we get low percentage of similarity. And this enables us to do analysis such as diversity profiling. Using the genetic barcode, we have seen a dramatic reduction in diversity of the parasite population in Atapur during the 2020 and 2021 season. The outbreak population is dominated by a single strand, which indicates selection of this particular strain. This figure is another way to show that there had been a dramatic reduction of population diversity in 2020 and 2021, where the outbreak occurred in Atapur. This reduction in diversity was due to a single strain that increased to high proportion having started at a low frequency in 2017. Um, this strain is shown in red. This outbreak strain was largely restricted to the Atapu province with a hotspot in the Pruvong district. Analysis of the drug resistant markers showed that this strain processes markers associated with resistance to chloroquine, sulfadoxine, pyrimethamine and atomicinin. Interestingly, the Kelch 13 mutation that confers the atomicinin resistant was the R539T, not the Kelch 13 C580Y mutation that dominates many parts of the lower Mekong region for many years. Previously, the KL1, KL1, A1, which carries both the uh, C580Y mutation and the plasmepsin amplification, dominates the lower uh, Mekong region in, the, in southern Laos. And this coincides with the high prevalence of the C580Y mutation, which is shown in red. However, in 2000 and, uh, 2020, we see a shift in dominance in Atapur. Uh, we see a decreased a reduction in the C580Y accompanied by a sharp increase of the R539T mutation. The R539T mutants replaced the KL1 PLA1 parasite during the outbreak. In particular, what we observed was the decline or absence of the plasmepsin amplification associated with resistance to uh, peparoquine in the atopyl population in this period. Um, so what we see is the, the dark green color was almost completely disappeared. And the dark green is uh, showed the KL1 PLA1. But there was still, um, some presence of the C580Y without the plasmepsin amplification uh, still circulating at a low frequency during the outbreak period. Um, to better understand the dynamic of the parasite groups, we analyzed the population structure using a related nest heat map based on the pairwise distant matrices of the genetic barcodes. Um, I know that this 
looks like a complex uh, figure and there's a lot going on here, but essentially what it's trying to show is that um, if the samples are similar to one another, they, they are in blue. And if the samples are different to one another, they are in red. Um, so this uh, big group over here is the R539T from the Atapro outbreak. And we see that the parasites are strikingly similar to one another. This heat map highlights the clo uh, clonality of the R539T group, which indicates the, the high level of inbreeding within this group. Um, the heat map also shows that the C580Y are not as highly inbred compared to the R5390. And, the, and another thing that this heat map shows is that the R5390 and the 580Y groups, they're not related to one another. There's a large distance between them. So in the um, findings that I've presented so far, we have seen that a multi-drug resistant strain with Kelch 13 R5390 is driving the outbreak in Atapur. So we then looked into the origin of this parasite. Using the genetic barcode, uh, we identified that the Atapur outbreak R5390 group A was highly related to the R5390 um, mutants that was collected in 2008 to 2000 and between the 2008 and 2013, which came from Thailand and Cambodia. And they shared about 80% of the barcode similarity, suggesting that the Atapro outbreak um, R5390 is a descendant of the R5390 mutant population that was first detected in Western Cambodia in 2008. And this map here uh, shows the genetic connection between these uh, earlier R5390 group and the latest R539 and how they are connected. When, when we combine these two uh, data sets, we see that they, they are related to one another. Okay, so now that we have seen the, uh, the findings, once we have determined the course, we communicated the findings to the public health experts to support their decision-making with the control measures. Um, so we are coming to, an, to the end of my talk. I hope that uh, we have demonstrated to you another use case of genetic surveillance in action, particularly the outbreak characterization. In the Atapro outbreak, we have found that the outbreak was driven by uh, pre-existing multi-drug resistant parasites. Understanding the character of the outbreak enables public health to identify optimal intervention for outbreak control. The benefit of using uh, an existing genetic surveillance that is in operation is that it enables us to deliver findings to public health authority, authorities within the same uh, malaria season, which allows for a timely response to the outbreak. Lastly, I would like to thank you all of our funders and collaborators that are way be beyond this list. Um, without great co network collaboration, we would not be able to do any of this. Um, but for the work that I presented here in, in the slides, I would like to specifically say thank you to uh, Simpei, um, Dr. Weir Pong, Dr. Gao, Dr. Nian, Dr. Mei Fong, the Genray team, Professor Dominic, uh, Dr. Roberto, Dr. Richard, Professor Aryan, Professor Nick Day. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Varanya, um, for uh, for this uh, uh, great presentation. Um, I, well, I I would like to also give my words of thanks to uh, to Simpe and to all the control programs that, uh, that uh, have supported us uh, in, in, in this analysis. Um, I, I think 
if I if I can just um, uh, look uh, for one, if I can just um, comment for a second about the um, some of the images that Dr. Varanya showed you. Um, what is interesting here is that also you've you've seen some new types of maps. Um, these maps uh, have to do with um, identifying strains and showing how they um, how they spread, showing where they're present, and showing how they're connected to each other. And as you as you've been able to see, we've been able to take more historical data from whole genome sequencing, and actually show. Uh, where we think these strains have originated and uh, how they're related to previous strain to, to previous uh, uh, parasites that we've identified. Also, uh, one of the exciting findings in this outbreak were, is basically that different drug resistant strains are somewhat fighting each other uh, for, uh, for dominance. And this is probably driven by our choices of, uh, of uh, um, therapies. And it's interesting how the C580Y and uh, KEL1, PLA1 strains seem to have decreased in numbers significantly uh, after uh, DHAP paraquine was, uh, was abandoned. Um, I think we have, uh, uh, Dr. Siv is uh, trying to ask a Ask something, Dr. Sif. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I have uh, two uh, question to the last speaker. Uh, one one um uh, we are noted that there is a a present of R five three ninety in Atapa province, and also this clap has been the try to replace C five eighty Y in the other as uh, the provinces um but made the link to outbreak but my question is um you also have been mentioned that from 2008 and 2013 uh, the sample from cambodia and thailand especially in cambodia they found this op, um r5 390 seem to be uh, uh, related with with the same the, the origin or uh, there is a, a can we conclude or conclude that there is a, a um a spread or or what? Um, this is the first question, and uh, um, the second question is uh, you um you 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 can see that the use case of genetic barcode here um um can uh, you has been the put hypothesis. Um, one is uh, whether we can use your genetic barcode to, uh, to to see the situation linked to outbreak, and 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 one one question you you have been raised about the whether the more biting um, the hypothesis in in your your thought your 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 presentation. So um, but I don't see the what the conclusion is uh, of that whether there is a, a link, or how, how can we conclude, how can we say that uh, by using GTED barcode to, to address is more by thing. Thank you. I think, thank you, Dr. Sif, for the question. Um, to, to answer the question, the first question you're asking about whether um, the R5390 in Atapur is related to the one in Cambodia that uh, much earlier, right? We, from the genetic barcodes, we saw that there are 50%, sorry, 80% similarity in the barcodes. But we also um, did some further uh, analysis using the whole genome sequencing um, with the IBD analysis. And we also found that they are, um, in IBD, they are related to one another in that way. Um, yeah. And with, is there anything you want to add? Uh, I, I just I wanted, just wanted to, mention to mention one, one more detail. <clears throat> so, because Dr. Siv 
ask whether we can uh, think of it as a spread. And in a way, yes. However, um, the, the, the parasites, as, as Varanya just pointed out, they're not identical. They're not exactly the same parasites that were circulating in Cambodia 2008, but they are the direct descendants of those. So what we think is that that strain has initially spread to Northern Cambodia, to Thailand, and something happened about three years ago, maybe four years ago, that they have also acquired some other um, uh, some other ancestry and mixed with some other strain. And after that, they have caused the outbreak. Is that correct, Varanya? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. And, and, and to address the second question about how can we use genetic barcodes to, to see whether there has been an increase um, more, the, bites. more bites with the mosquito. <laughs> So for us, um, what we did was we tried to use the diversity profile. So how our hypothesis is that if there's just normal, if there's like more bites, we wouldn't see um, the, you know, we wouldn't see the diversity of the population goes down, but it would either be the same, remain relatively the same, or it would have been increased. And so that's why, when we, that was um, just kind of our hypothesis going into this investigation. So when we started this investigation and we saw that the diversity was dramatically reduced, it gave us the indication that, oh, this is, there, there has been a selection going on, that there is some um, yeah, advantage to, to these like, the parasites that has been selected. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I, I just I just would like to to ask one one more question linked to Dr. Olivo. You 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 have I'm I'm not clear, but uh, um just uh, uh, want to learn more. Um, you have been said that um because of the 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 decreasing or use using the H A P, so so that that is a. Uh, the reduce of C five eighty Y and replaced by O five three ninety. Is it that? But I understand it at the per the outbreak link linked to uh, the late uh, uh, replacement of the ACT because they they still use uh, DJ PIP. So um um failure is there. So I I think something. Yeah. Um. Yes, you must you must take this just as a hypothesis. I I don't think we can prove that. But what I was saying is that it's interesting to see that the Kel1 PLA1 has been uh, decreasing very rapidly in frequency, not only in uh, in southern Laos but also in Cambodia, from what I understand. Um, when uh, when DHA piperaquin was uh, uh, stopped. So, and I mean, it would make sense because uh, the, the, the particular advantage that strain has is the combination of artemisinin and piperaquine resistance. So uh, I, we are we're putting together a hypothesis, but we, we can't exactly prove it. Um, it and it is interesting that um, what we have observed is true also in southern Laos, where they were not using the HAP periquin. However, this is very close to the borders with Thailand and with Cambodia, where in fact the HAP periquin was used. So I think there may be some spillover effect because there was a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of movement across those borders. So, um, but I, I, I don't have any proof of these things. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so I, what I would like to do now is to, is to pass on to the uh, next speaker. And as I mentioned, in, uh, in, the previous, uh, uh, in the previous presentation, we've actually seen some sort of new types of maps, new types of information that we would like to deliver to the uh, public health authorities. And 
um, actually the next presentation is really about uh, how do we communicate better with the, with, with the control programs? How do we give some new insights that we can get from our genetic surveillance? And how do we empower uh, the experts in the countries to better analyze our data and to, uh, and to uh, do their own uh, investigations from the data we deliver to them. So um, I would like uh, Aria to tell us a bit more about this and about the training programs that she's working on. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Oriwo, for the introduction. And, and first, I, I would like to add more uh, uh, for the audience. If you have any question, could you please uh, type your question in the Q&A box and, and uh, moderator will pick up your question at the end of this session for the asking to the panelists. Okay, now I will start my uh, presentation on the expanding genetic surveillance through the communication and training. So in this section, uh, in this topic, I will give you more overview on the how, how can we uh, conduct the genetic surveillance uh, network in, in, the, in each country in, in uh, the Lameco project, and especially in Laos that we have experience to find uh, the uh, requirements and uh, the, uh, that there are the outbreaks in Laos. So how can we use this uh, genetic surveillance network to communicate and to provide the information to the uh, national control program and stakeholder? So, First, uh, okay. So this is the overview of uh, our project that yesterday made uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Oro already give, give you, gave you some, some overview of the project. So our project would like to promote the application of malaria parasite uh, by using the genetic surveillance to support decision-making in malaria control and elimination efforts for the national marine control programs. So in our project, there are three groups of uh, our partner. First, we include the national marine control programs who that uh, have the information about the malaria situation and also have the authority to, to make the uh, drug policy for marine control in each country. Second, we have the local and international sci scientific partners and the third one, we are uh, delay making scientific support, give the uh, support on the uh, technical and also coordinate with the, the like a uh, ethical issue and also a need of uh, uh, proceed in each country. After we have the, uh, uh, our project have the, the main objective that uh, we like to use for the uh, data from the genetic surveillance in, in, two, in two main uh, topics. First, for the control program, just like to see how the drug resistance occur in each country, how, how about the treatment efficacy and outbreak intervention. The second one is about the genetic epidemiology, including the drug resistance markers, parasite strain, operation structure of parasite in each country, and transmission intensity and the imported case and just like the cross border transmission of the parasite. So to, to get to this use case, there are uh, four main actions that we do in our project. First, it involves with the local sample collection and processing in each country. Second is about the country specific and collective data analysis and sharing of the data between country. The third one is how uh, know how to translate and interpret genetic data in public health context. And you know that, that maybe the genetic data is quite hard to understand by, by in general. So we try to use uh, the way and make the, the content of the information from the genetic to give the uh, interpretable or easily to understand to the public health. The last one we we have the activity to give the result back uh, with the genetic report task or just like in case uh, and, and try to make like a maps or country report that easy for the programmatic use. 
and also uh, some off-site report that we will uh, publish later. So this is the activity in our project in the first phase of the Lemekong Act. Now in the second phase is, is in the tran translational phase. So first we have to know what is the requirements from our stakeholder. To get the requirements, we have uh, like a virtual meeting and also we try to get uh, to know what is the problem in this country from the questionnaire and also from the rhetorical reviews. After we get the requirements, we have the operations and analysis and translation in, in many activities, just like in the technical training. In the first phase, we have like a few training to, to for the staff to, to know how to collect the sample and data. And we plan to have the online training for the scientific partner and also selected uh, national memory control program and other scientific partner that would like to engage more in data generation, analysis, and interpretation that we can use for the uh, regional database. And for the effective uh, uh, way to, to communicate to the uh, national control program after we get the information, we, we make the uh, summary report for the policy maker and also we provide some uh, in future, we, we, we think to have like a dashboard on it that easily to, to see uh, the outbreak or any uh, drug resistant market in this region. And like uh, now, uh, we plan to have also online materials that can know what, how to use the genetic uh, data for epidemiology use. And just like now we have the knowledge exchange that's like a scientific forum and the way that people can exchange uh, to know the data and, and also how to, to get the sharing result or project implementation experience that we, we can share among our stakeholders. So now we will uh, go to see what, what we have did uh, for the uh, Lab for the Maria Epidemiology in Laos. This is the background for the uh, Maria in Laos. So in Laos now they use uh, artemeter and mifentrin is the uh, first right drug to treat the uncomplicated controlling case. And the point of concern is previously there are the uh, pre-existing of artemisinin resistant parasite, especially uh, they, they have the problem with the spread of the HAPPQ resistant parasite across the sub region, okay, in the southern Lao, even though the people who has not been used in Lao. And recently they have the outbreak in the article COVID. So from this point, we try to use the genetic surveillance of malaria parasite to providing affordable and monitoring of the parasite response to different treatment at medical centers with few resources. So from, from this uh, genetic surveillance, we think, uh, we hope that we can, can make an early detection of resistance. So it will lead to timely action to prevent the spread of the drug uh, or, or the outbreak of malaria or drug resistant malaria and limit the public health consequence. And, and another one is uh, for the outbreak characterization, as you can see from the previous uh, presentation from Dr. Wallen. So now we go to the first phase. What, what we have need to make the network workable or capable in, in, in Laos. So there are three main uh, members. So first is National Maria Control Program. We include the Center of Maria, Mariaology, Paristology and Etymology or Sente from the Ministry of Public Health because they have uh, authority for the control and elimination policy. And, and that is the good thing that uh, for the, it, for, uh, it allows Ministry of Health classify our project or the limit project as a surveillance activity. So for the national benefits, so we don't need uh, uh, the required additional informed consent as like for the, uh, as like the way for the, uh, do the research. So we can collect the sample uh, in, 
real time. Yes. And next, uh, we have the scientific partner uh, from Blouse or Ford. Also, hospital will come try recently. So, from the Lombu, they provide uh, the well trained staff. We have the Ropo sampling network, uh, get the dry bus for sample collection and also data management. So, we have the uh, coordinator and also they provide the group calls to each site in, in I mean, uh, clinical site in, in our field to get the sample collected. And after the sample have processes and, and got from the site, uh, it's sent to the JLA scientific support and coordination. So we have the standardized protocol for sample collection, processing, and data analysis. And also to support the uh, effective use of the data. So in our project, we try to develop data analysis pipelines and through for translate genotype data into more interpretable and actionable forms. So the thing that we hope to, to see is data sharing in this, this sub-regional so we can make like a, a overview and, and try to use the data to share and, and to solve the problem at the sub-regional level. Okay, so this is from the phase one. We, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Gao mentioned that, uh, the Maria is first, first side of the, uh, that, that have the problem in the five province in Southern Laos. Okay, in Sawanake, Sarawan, Seiko, Jabarsap, and Atipu. So in these uh, five provinces, we have uh, 107 study sites over there. They are the coordinator to go to the site and then do the sample collection. And also they have training field staff to, to get the, uh, uh, driver spot from the uh, figure, okay, as you can see from the figure, and also they have the communication with the uh, community to get more uh, convenient to proceed the, uh, uh, our project. So from the phase one, we can have output and impact that. The one thing that we, we, we can see clearly, so from the genetic surveillance, uh, the Ministry of Health in Laos used it to change the policy because we, we uh, they saw that HAP people queen a uh, resistance strain is spread across uh, across the border and also in, in the South Lao they changed the policy and then they used the uh, artimeter remifentrin for the first time as well. And the second one, so from from this uh the, from the activity in the phase one, we can attribute the effective uh, genetic surveillance network in Laos with the well trained staff. So we can promptly to uh, go to the next step if there are something for the monitoring and detection of research. So we can see. I'm sorry. So just the time that we translate from the phase one to phase two, there are the notice and from the same way that there are the increase in the facilitalum case in other province. So we can proceed uh, our project directly for the characterized outbreaks in the phase two. So this is the, the way that we use uh, our communication uh, network and also train well trained staff to do the things. First, uh, there are the sample correction in the Atapu province. Probably after we, we get the information, there are the, the, the case number increase and do the amplicon sequencing. At the time, we, we did it in the sample. Okay, welcome sample institute and do the data analysis so we can know about the drug resistant mutation and prediction phenotype. And also, we can see the network connection or genetic connectedness and population diversity of the process, as you see from previous uh, data from the Dr. Valanya. After we got this information, we, we uh, have communicate back to the same way directly, immediately after we got the uh, result. So we report and discuss all the spread of drug resistant parasite in particular province. And after communication, we, we know, uh, we got the feedback from Sempe that they would like to know more about the MD-R1 copy number because they consider 
uh, that they're afraid that there will be uh, resistance to our chemical or uh, our a chemical remove sentiment that uh, they use in in the as a first line that in their country. So for the extended network of communications, after we got the feedback from Sempe, we communicate uh, to our group uh, by uh, Dr. Nian. Uh, she have the lab in our crew that can assay for the MTR1 copy number. And also we make the additional analysis to see the origins of the imaging of drug resistant parasite. After we got some uh, initial information, so we communicate back because uh, uh, we think of the data usage and, and to, to prevent the uh, spreading of drug resistant into sub -region. So we uh, try to communicate back to uh, the BHO also to to, to have the response for this uh, outbreak. So uh, this is the summary that, that we have did along with the thing that, that we have the, in the outbreak. So from outbreak confirmed that we got the information for the sample and we respond immediately for the collection of the sample by the Lombu to describe uh, the, the sample in Atuku province. And we did in case uh, it between the cause of uh, outbreak you know, using our technology that the amplicon sequencing and communicate back to uh, all of the stakeholder to have the uh, uh, to try to to see how how we can control the outbreak uh, with the sample and uh, the BHO and further to make it sustainable and and to monitoring the the prevalence of this strain. So now we, we, this is the challenge for us to, to have such a kind of, of, of the way to sustain the, the system to respond for the uh, spreading of the malaria in Italy. So the, first, we, we need to train and think of the available online platform for selecting, visualizing, and retrieving uh, genetic epidemiology data. Also, data challenge is the one that is important, even international level or international level, to support regional surveillance. And another one is the planning and adapting a sustainable surveillance system to extend to new use cases that will be necessary in the final step to work elimination. So to 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 uh, to make these challenges happen uh, to success, we we used another activity. Okay, many activity to cope with this uh, shine, including the in-country laboratories. Just now we have the central lab in, in Vietnam in our crew that will support the uh, sample analysis in this sub-region. And another one is uh, for the uh, data analysis, we develop the GRC Maria package that we use for processing data and analysis to create, create maps and also to visualize population structure that is easy to understand for the health staff. So from, from this resource, in future, we would like to have the training course and meeting for the scientific partner and MCP and academics that, that we help them to, to make uh, uh, themselves to, to do the analysis by themselves and provide information to, to marine control program in Tambri manner. And also, uh, as, as we have now, we have the scientific forum and also joint regional data event that we can share information together and we know the situation of each country so we can have a response uh, immediately. Okay, so finally, I would like to thank to Sempe and all of the staff in, in field, okay, to, to collect the sample and also Longlu for the scientific support. Moro and our crew that providing uh, support for the repository and also welcome center is for the data analysis. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Haria. This, um, this for this uh, for this overview of uh, uh, how we work together with the with the control programs and uh, you know the last. Uh, last couple of years, unfortunately, have been um, difficult in terms of communicating with uh, with.
with the control programs. And uh, what we hope is that the type of work that we've done with SIMPE, uh, we will continuously be uh, doing with, uh, uh, with the control programs in, in all the countries. Um, so there was, um, there was some talk about uh, training. This is uh, going to come live online in the second half of, uh, uh, of, of this year. And what we are hoping is that we're going to make it very accessible um, such that uh, different levels of expertise can be accommodated. You will not need to be uh, a genetics expert from day one. Uh, you and um, and the idea is to is to really um, sort of help the development of uh, local knowledge. For that purpose, um, I would actually call on all the uh, all our country partners, uh, you know, to highlight if you know of other partners we can engage in these exercises. We would very much like to train. Uh, you know, university PhD students or uh, technical members of the control programs and other uh, people in the countries so that we can form a sort of big community of people who work together to analyze the data and to share it and, and so on. So, uh, and, and with that, I would like to uh, just open up to uh, a couple of questions here that have been, uh, that have been asked. Um, so there's a, there's a question from uh, Tess to Dr. Keo. Um, she says, I wonder what SIMPE have done after receiving the results from Genray about the outbreak in Atapu. Uh, did SIMPE implement something different? So how is SIMPE responding to the outbreaks? Dr. Keo, could you comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Olivo. <laughs> For our break in Atapu, we, we, we have less fun like uh, we have the active, uh, active case detection in the community to know the second infection, how many, how many positive. And then for the anti malarial duct, we, we continue to use the AL because AL is still high efficacy and uh, actually, like uh, you know, the, like uh, we know, the southern part of Laos, we have the yin uh, K13C, uh, 580, and R5393. Uh, but for this, uh, we, we, we think resistant only actinicinin, but uh, for partner that we, we don't know. And then uh, we still to use the, the, the AL also, but uh, like uh, this year, we, we are waiting the list from the TES. We, we want to know, uh, we want to know like a uh, uh, delay parasite clear time or not, this is first. And second, uh, we want to know the that area occur the new uh, gene or not. And then second, we want to know the uh, partner that places time or not. And then every two year or five, three year, we update the national treatment guideline if the uh, the uh, ultimaria like uh, the efficacy like a uh, go down. Okay, we can we can discard, and then uh, we look at the not only at the pool, like a uh, savanna kid also uh, the almost the lifestyle the community uh, stay in the forest because this is the main of uh, occupation. And then second for the behavior, uh, they don't use the uh, uh, bed net. We provide the long lasting net in the community, but they go to outside like uh, they stay at the uh, forest worker or farmer. They no need to use because they they answer us when we have the question. They, they say really hot at the outside and cannot cannot use bed net like this. And then uh, that area like uh, have the vector for transmission. We, we we want to protect them. And this year we have the accelerate strategy PA. 
Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yep. So essentially, and um, we provide TDA. Now this is the Ravan provide TDA Ravan. Um, the uh, next month the uh, treatment for let's go and end of this year we assessment again the positive case go down or not or no positive like this we the malaria control program we have the activity to respond not only uh, at the uh, five provinces we we do like this yes Uh, so, uh, Dr. Keo, well, thank you. I mean, if I if I can just uh, uh, sort of capture the essence of that. I, so basically, um, this was a trigger for you to initiate more uh, uh, analysis of the efficacy of the current treatments, but also to increase your control measures in in those areas. The, would you say that that's a good summary? Uh... Uh, we, we, for the, uh, for example, for Atapu, okay, okay, Atapu, I, I talk only Atapu. Now we have the, uh, if that earlier have the four case, we tell them to do ACD because we have, we have the SMS weekly to report. And then we have the, we have S2, we have the dashboard to, to, to know uh that earlier have the case and then we, we last fun yes my answer is the uh, yeah like uh, your question or not because yes yes thank you Mr. like this <laughs> okay the we got a couple more questions for you actually these two are somewhat related so uh dr nian is asking uh could you please provide more um, more about the intervention using Laos during the two periods observed the, when we observed the C580Y versus the outbreak. Um, and, um, and then there's a question from Richard Pearson at Sangha saying, uh, it has been mentioned that uh, DHAP paraquine has not been used as treatment in Laos, but could it be Maybe is it being used unofficially, uh, you know, on the, you know, from the market stalls or something? Um, maybe, Dr. Kyo, you can comment on these two things. I believe um, the Laos used uh, AL uh, for all this period, right? Uh, yes, uh, until now, my country used only AL. But for the DHAP paraquin, uh, the national treatment that I uh, don't use, but uh, uh, like uh, you know, the some some border they have the pharmacy stop and they, they like uh, uh, the list that come to Lao, but uh, like uh, no register, we 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 we, we, we don't know exactly, but we 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 find one or two uh, pharmacy stop, they have. Uh, uh, the SAP Pelican, and then I we inform to food and drug to check again because we we tell no need to use because less is tongue only for this, right? Okay, well, that's that's great, that's very helpful. Um, uh, yes, and I think it is no, um no surprise that these DHAP paraquin strains were more common in the provinces that are by the border with other countries where is uh, in fact probably people can also bring uh, the drugs that are used in one country across to another so i think uh, it is entirely possible that we got some of that yeah um so sorry just to go back um uh, we 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 have um, uh, Jim De has joined us from uh, from Mali. Uh, it's uh, really great to have you here. Uh, and I I, I did I did um, uh, sort of answer his question. Uh, uh, you know how does this information help 
to manage the, uh, the, the, the outbreak. One thing that I wanted to uh, add to what I said, that which is that actually the fact that we know that these parasites uh, don't have uh, copy number variations in critical genes has is actually helpful not only to Laos but also to neighboring countries like Cambodia where uh, mefloquine has been used for example and as we as we've seen parasites uh, really they know no borders they they will travel across so it is important actually that we uh, spread this information to the neighboring countries but one thing I wanted to add and I will get off my soapbox after this, um, is that observing what has happened between the C580Y and the 539T um, strains, where in fact, we thought the five, sorry, 539T had almost disappeared after being, um, you know, after being at fairly high frequency in Thailand a few years ago, we thought it had almost gone away. And C580Y was clearly the winner in the region. And it looks like you don't need to do that much of a change, uh, you know, change the, 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 the frontline therapy in one country or another for uh, things to completely change. And I think it's important from now on moving forward that we expect that this thing can happen and we expect that we need to monitor these strains so we know whether the drugs remain effective or not. And Dr. Sev, you want to make a comment? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Oliver. I, I just want to, to highlight that uh, the, the genetic study epidemiology that has been cooperated from national program with the Jane Remakong that uh, lead by Dr. the Olivo also very important. Because right now um, um, we have some uh, pre preliminary result that we don't have any copy of the R1 uh, has been shown in our data. So that's why the, the current treatment guideline still continue to use ASMQ uh, as our first line treatment. This is very important. Because currently uh, the, the TS, uh, 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 Efficacy study cannot be performed because of the, the number of okay, sample is not enough. So, so the, the genetic epidemiology is very important to instead of this. And, and one more thing I just would like to highlight that uh, because I see the, the slide of the previous speaker talking about the cross-border um, uh, uh, um, collaboration in terms of genetic epidemiology to share the, the data to view each other. The very important that we can uh, uh, know in advance possibility to be uh, uh, resistant to, to the other side. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a tremendous comment. And I'm, I'm so pleased to hear, uh, to see that the control programs are very, very open in this region and they are, they, they believe they really believe that sharing the data can they can help each other so um, I, I think this is a good time for uh, for a five minute break and after that we will resume with our final session thank you very much to all the speakers hello, hello. Good, good afternoon, afternoon. Welcome, welcome back. And now we are um, we are just about to start the last session of uh, of this event, um, where we where we talk a little bit about things that are not um, are not directly um, uh, sort of work that we've done with uh, Jen Remikong, but um, but we want to give some. Uh, different perspective of how things are being done in other contexts, in Africa in particular. And uh, we want to talk a bit about uh, Plasmodium vivax, which of course is a, uh, is a much less studied, but um, 
a highly interesting parasite, especially in this region. So to, um, to begin with, uh, in session four, um, we are delighted and very honored to have uh, um, uh, Dr. Lucas Amenga Itego from uh, University of Ghana joining us um, to, to talk about uh, genetic surveillance of malaria in Africa. Now, just as a, as a way of introduction, um, uh, Lucas has been, uh, well, has been a long time uh, friend of malaria gen, and uh, um, he, he is uh, conducting a, a, um, a project in, uh, in Ghana, which is uh, uh, very similar, both in objectives and in technologies, to what we're doing uh, in Southeast Asia with Jen Remikong. So what I'll, I, I hope he'll be able to give us uh, a, a view on, uh, on how that is proceeding and perhaps how in the future our projects can work together. Lucas, is that, are you there? Yes, Oliver, I'm here. Good, welcome, take over please. Can you guys see my slides? Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Olivo and all the organizers. Thank you for the opportunity to share from my perspective how uh, genetic surveillance of malaria is doing in, in Africa. I know there are several people who could have given this talk, probably much better, but I thank you for settling on me to, to, to contribute to your, your meeting. I start by acknowledging our local team um, and partners who have been supporting my work in, in, in GSM um, in Ghana here and across uh, our uh, other partners in, in Africa. Particularly, I want to mention Dr. Kezia, who is our uh, National Malaria Control Program Manager. She's been uh, very supportive of our work. And uh, of course, um, the workhorse in our labs is, is Joyce. And uh, we're really grateful to the Sanger team for supporting us through all our challenges. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, particularly want to thank Savanti, uh, Vicky, Dominic, everybody in the team, informatics people, uh, we are grateful for your support. My talk, I've structured my talk in a way that I would want to start by giving you uh, an idea or a sense of how malaria and the landscape is across Africa, uh, the kinds of um, things that we think we can do with GSM, um, uh, the genetic threats uh, that we can uh, begin to uh, through and shed light on using GSM technology, and uh, the current situation as far as uh, antimalarial resistance is, and a little bit on insectal resistance and some of the uh, mixed bag of uh, uh, use cases that uh, I think from my perspective, I think uh, various countries would uh, want to adapt and, and, and increase or expand as, as we, we, we GSM uh, takes root in, on, on the continent. Also uh, GSM capacity and the current key players that I am aware of, I, I would highlight some of those uh, uh, focal uh, uh, studies going on and talk a little bit about stakeholder engagement and the challenges for sustainable GSM in Africa. And then I will conclude and give you some future perspectives. So malaria transmission, uh, vector landscape, and the parasite is quite uh, heterogeneous across our continent. Uh, we do have uh, perennial transmission and across Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but there's also marked seasonality as you go uh, from west to east, and uh, that is important in, in the way uh, gene flow is, is, is assessed. And we do have uh, quite uh, a good number of vectors that are very competent. Anopheles gumby, uh, Fenestus, uh, th these are quite uh, popular in, 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 in Africa and Arabiansis. There's a mixed bag of others that, uh, uh, depending on where you are on the continent, uh, you'll have to contend with 
probably uh, three or, or four different uh, very competent, equally competent vectors. Uh, and so that affects the way uh, transmission and prevalence of parasites vary across our continent. So they, they, the question I ask is, uh, how could GSM or genetic surveillance of malaria uh, help us to, to better present these maps in a way that we can highlight the risk that, that uh, different uh, products would, would help us to, to, to understand uh, going forward uh, when, when we are able to expand GSM in our continent. So within our continent, we do have, uh, just like in many other places, uh, in the different drugs being used, but there's a lot of commonality. As you would see, uh, our frontline drugs uh, in this example countries, you can see um, we AL, tetanamidiquine, uh, DHA, piperaquine. All these these are quite popular on our continent, and we expect that we can uh, share data uh, that uh, we generate regarding uh, some of the genetic threats that uh, we, 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 we would probably see uh, that that are arising against uh, the, these frontline medicines. There are also um, a lot of interventions, some are targeted, like the seasonal malaria tumor prevention that uh, is targeted in, in areas of high transmission that have seasonality, like it happens in West Africa, where children uh, are given uh, preventive treatment, uh, uh, entering the, the, the high transmission season. Right. And these need to be monitored to see if uh, these drugs are imposing uh, a little uh, more selecting, selective pressure on the parasite populations. Uh, there's long use of insecticide nets and IRS is going on. National malaria control programs are trying to drive down malaria, uh, indoor residual spraying. There are also, there's also I, uh, malaria prevention in pregnancy as used in SP. Uh, these are all interventions that uh, across Africa are, are happening as we speak. And uh, uh, S SMC, which is not happening in all places, but uh, uh, is, is key because it is it's targeting uh, children under five. And, and of course, uh, uh, imposing extra pressure, we would want to, to see what, what would happen uh, with the past operations going forward. So what, what uh, uh, would a GSM help us, how is it going to help us to, to uh, properly gauge the effect of these um, uh, interventions and also uh, measure their impact in a way, sort of um, trying to, you know, monitor and and and, and see what um, uh, would happen post uh, uh, SMC and and also what the implications are for uh, malaria control. There are myriad of vectors, as I said, that are, are across our that some, a lot of them are common. Anopheles gambi is a competent vector across uh, our countries. There, there's Anopheles canestus that's occurring many places, but there are some unique countries that have uh, unique vectors uh, like we, we have in, in, in East Africa, Tanzania, Ethiopia. And so uh, it will be interesting if, if uh, uh, GSM takes roots in Africa and, and we can compare our data to see what uh, we, we, we get out of, uh, of the African landscape. So the potential use cases, we will want to fight genetic threats. We want to look at the risk for antimalarial drug resistance, uh, diagnose, diagnostic failure due to HRP2 3 gene, gene deletions are also important in our, our toolkit as Africans, because as I said, you know, transmission is quite is perennial. And so it's important that we are using our frontline drugs effectively to treat people who are, are, are actually uh, are having malaria and, and parasites can be detected accurately. And as you, you may be aware, the WHO uh, threshold is a prevalence of 5% for you to change uh, your RDT. And so uh, given the, fa the fact that there are, not, there are not really available alternatives, uh, it's important that we keep monitoring and ensuring that uh, we're keeping an eye on that uh, prevalence. We have been using insecticides uh, to treat our bed nets for a very long time. Uh, that intervention has several decades and um, there is indoor residual spraying that's using uh, various classes of insecticides and farmers are using insecticides as well. So it is no surprise that insecticide resistance in our vector mosquitoes 
would arise. And so it's, it's, it's important that we generate data that can be used to monitor uh, uh, mosquito populations and, and see what kind of resistance that uh, we can assay. Uh, also, uh, in general, pa pa parasite population genetics, looking at the population diversity of parasites uh, within, within borders, like we do in Ghana here, trying to, to, to use GSM to see uh, what, what is the, the landscape of uh, resistance mosquitoes uh, or parasites, plasmodium parasites in, in our borders. And we can uh, integrate our data to look beyond uh, uh, our borders into the regional and possibly in the future extend to other parts of the continent. And for areas in East Africa, uh, where there is uh, low transmission, I reckon they can uh, begin to look at importation of specific parasite genotypes between, between uh, defined areas and also uh, generally see how uh, interventions are disrupting the parasite population structure. So what, what is the current situation in Africa uh, regarding antimalarial drug resistance? Uh, Kelp stage 13 since uh, it arose in uh, Southeast Asia in, in your region and, and, and we, we are all aware of the historical spread. So the danger is uh, Africa needs to plan itself to, to, to see what happens uh, uh, going forward. And in 2018 in Rwanda, uh, Kelch 561 was identified. Uh, it's, it's been gradually increasing the frequency in Rwanda, but you, you look at the clinical cases and, and treatment outcomes and the, 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 the fact is, uh, we still haven't seen you know, ACT, marked ACT resistance. They, they remain effective in Rwanda and also other parts of the continent. Several independent uh, uh, detections of uh, specific character T mutations like the R622I mutation in Africa, the Horn of Africa, Sudan, Somalia. Um, these have been detected and uh, they need to be monitored, but as of now, we don't see their, 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 them altering treatment uh, outcomes uh, uh, to our frontline drugs that I mentioned earlier on. But the absence of uh, uh, resistance simply tells us that we, would, we, we need to keep an eye on, on, on our frontline drugs, we need to continue to monitor, and GSM comes in handy for us to, to be able to do this in a, in a, with, with, with greater depth and, and uh, 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 the opportunity it gives us to, to be more accurate in, 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 in determining uh, these resistance alleles uh, going forward. The partner drugs are important, not just at the listening. And you, you, you saw from our previous slide that there are quite a number of common partner drugs that are being used. Uh, Chloroquine is not uh, completely gone in, 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 in Ethiopia. They will use it to, to treat Vivax in, in Madagascar. They use it to treat Vivax as well. So uh, it's not, uh, we are not getting a complete expansion of, of uh, chloroquine sensitive parasites in Africa. And, and there, there remains uh, some you know, focal areas where chloroquine resistance is important to monitor. Also, uh, in terms of vectors, um, our use of uh, paratroids for many years uh, has, has uh, 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 led to significant resistance in, in, against paratroid insecticides that we use to control uh, mosquito vectors, particularly the KDR L995F allele, which is very dominant in West Africa, spreading towards Central and of course uh, Central Southeast direction. Uh, this is an important mutation that uh, when is is quite prevalent in West Africa, and 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 of, uh, sort of undermining uh, paratroid that class of insecticides that we use as aerosols at home or uh, or treatment in our, our bed nets to prevent uh, mosquitoes from you know uh, getting access to to us as we sleep. And, and uh, there are other uh, SNPs in that, in, that, in that region of the VGSC gene, uh, sodium voltage channel, KT channel gene that uh, uh, is a target gene for paratroids. And these need to be monitored uh, because there's evidence 
from Flaxen and his colleagues that when certain haplotypes, uh, when they occur with the 995 f they do uh, increase uh, resistance significantly. And as we're moving uh, uh, towards adding PBOs to our, our insecticide treated nets together with palitroids in order to try to improve their efficacy, uh, no one is sure what, what the future holds for, for PBO treated nets. Uh, so we need to keep an eagle eye on the, on, on, on the, on, on the process and, and continue to monitor those nets to see what benefit PBOs can, can, can impose uh, on that uh, long-term treated nets. And uh, if um, the, the benefit that we hope to achieve by combining these insecticides uh, will stand the test of time. So I, I mentioned the, the VGSC gene. Uh, this is a, 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 a voltage gated channel uh, involved in um, the, the proper function of the mosquito nervous system. And as you can see, there are four domains, and these domains are, 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 are critical for monitoring in, in, in the resistance because uh, as the L995 locus here, uh, as you can see, is key uh, uh, in resistance, and there are a myriad of them, haplotypes formed over there and there. And so it's important uh, for us to, you know, not, uh, lose sense of the fact that the additional PBOs may distort uh, the current uh, patterns that we're seeing in terms of the, 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 the SNPs and, and uh, uh, the mutations that are occurring in this gene. And so I'll sh just show you a little bit of uh, what is happening in Ghana, specifically you can see the L995F that I was talking about. It's, a, it's 100%, it's, the, the mutant allele F is fixed across my country, but from the south, the north, and, 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 and the, the middle belt of our country, it's totally fixed. And uh, you can see all other mutations that may potentially form haplotypes with this mutation and cause increased resistance to, to Gambia. But when you come to uh, Anopheles Kulusi, we, Kulusi, you can see that uh, the resistance to Kulusi I for the same uh, 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 locus is not, it's not fixed yet, but it's high. And it's highly variable across uh, different parts of our country. This kind of monitoring um, uh, is, is critical for our NMCP because then it allows them to, to think about how to shuffle uh, their insecticides and, and also uh, you know, plan going forward, making decisions as to uh, which parts of the country uh, they should target with what insecticides. So the key players, as I said, in, 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 to my knowledge, in, in, in uh, genetic surveillance of malaria in Africa, uh, are, are members of the PDNA, who is, is a, a group of uh, researchers that have been working together for many years, led by Professor Jim D. And uh, in Ghana, we do have uh, uh, a GSM project, like uh, Oliver mentioned, and we're doing this in collaboration with um, Alfred Amago and the Gambia. And of course, um, Anita is in the Bush Memorial Institute of Medical Research in the University of Ghana. She also looking at GSM and we are complementing each other, working with our NMCP to see how uh, we can uh, uh, drive GSM in, in, in our country and, and, and use it to, to help the NMCP to make informed decisions about insecticides and uh, uh, drugs. Also, uh, uh, in East Africa, I know Deos and his group working with his, his partners in the US and, 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 and in the summer, are looking at um, you know, employing GSM to, to monitor their parcel populations. Uh, the, the Tanzania has a, a wide uh, heterogeneity in transmission, and so they have the opportunity to do a lot of a lot of things, uh, uh, expand their use cases to be able to understand various aspects of, of their continent. I know there are several others that could be doing things in the continent, but I, I don't uh, I kind of say for sure. And so uh, these are the, the, the key players uh, in our continent at the moment. And what are the tools that are gaining traction? Uh, we are using the amplicon sequencing approach and uh, I know the Gambia, Mali are considering uh, the same approaches, but in Tanzania, uh, molecular inversion probes 
uh, are, are being tested um, uh, to, to, to look for variation of plasmodium falciform. And so uh, there's opportunity in, in our continent for people to um, either use both approaches or, or one or the other. And uh, the opportunity still exists for us to do whole genome sequencing approaches. Uh, as you may be aware, the, the, the tools are at different, different stages of development. Uh, we, we do have uh, better understanding, better, more working tools of the amplicon sequencing toolkit than we'll have for uh, assays that we want to do on the, the insect side or uh, mosquito uh, uh, side of things. And so with our mosquitoes, what we're doing is trying to do whole genome sequencing for mosquitoes and then do amplicon sequencing for uh, uh, plasmodium falciform and uh, try to look at population studies, look at drug resistance, um, insectal resistance with whole genome sequencing, HRP2, 3 deletions. They are very critical for our NMCP as the WHO is pushing for Africa, African uh, 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 nanero control programs to try to understand the prevalence of these deletions in, in their uh, areas of, uh, of, of jurisdiction. So stakeholder engagement um, is, is critical for the success of GSM in Africa. Uh, we do have uh, relationships between our NMCPs, but these remain quite fragile. Uh, the, the NMCPs uh, fundamentally do not <clears throat> usually, you know, have technical understanding of the data. The data is quite challenging both for uh, researchers and NMCPs, and so. Uh, we, those who are in the, 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 the GSM uh, space in Africa, need to find creative ways to build bridges with the NMCPs, try to sustain their interest, and uh, try to see how we can support the, the, the NMCPs to appreciate uh, the products that we would be turning out and, and uh, help them to see how they can integrate our work into their, their daily work and, and, and influence decision making. In our case, my observation is where the NMCP managers have a scientific background, this relationship becomes a little bit easier. Uh, there is a, a better understanding and then there, there, there is room for discussion and, and uh, we can work together to, to uh, formulate uh, uh, use cases that are most beneficial to them. So there, there's a need to continue to engage NMCPs and, and across Africa, People are using uh, various approaches that are custom to their, their, their environment to, to try to, to, to test out how best to uh, sustain the interests of the NMCPs. The point is uh, uh, the NMCPs in most countries have selected health facilities that they, 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 they call their sentinel sites that they are used, they use to, to you know, sample and probe uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, frontline compounds. And so it is, it's in, our, it's in our interest to ensure that our sampling that we do for genetic surveillance does coincide with, with some of these facilities that they are covering uh, in their daily work so that data can be easily translatable to their decision making. And the only way to achieve that is when we have a close relationship with our NMCPs. Uh, so we're trying to, to work on that fragile relationship and strengthen it uh, going forward and, and hoping that. Uh, we can achieve uh, a sustainable uh, GSM. In the light of this, we, 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 our NMCPs in Africa need reorientation and training. Uh, they do have technical people working with them. And, and as I said, the complexity of the data we, we, we hope to present to them requires that they, they, they build some technical understanding of the basics of, 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 of GSM and the products that we, we would be giving sharing with the, with, the, with the NMCP. So basic skills um, and the change in mindset, the, the NMCPs uh, look at researchers as, as people driving this uh, uh, initiative. But I think uh, going forward, it's about time for the, the NMCP to take center stage in trying to, to influence uh, what we do, uh, how, how we define our use cases, what, what we need to, to do that benefits them the most. And so it's, it's delightful to have Professor Jim Lee and, and Polina getting a grant from the, the Gates Foundation to engage the NMCP uh, across Africa.
to begin to build their capacity to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, tailor their, their, their needs uh, uh, for GSM and see what kind of interventions they can put in place that will help them to appreciate the data and also uh, strengthen that relationship that our uh, NMCPs have with scientists that are working in the space of uh, uh, genetic surveillance of, of malaria. So it's, it's, it's a welcome uh, 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 grant that, that uh, would, would, we hope would impact the, the NMCPs across our continent and then increase our, our uh, engagement and lead to positive outcomes uh, going forward. The, the NMCPs, in my view, uh, currently look at uh, GSM as a, uh, something that uh, researchers are, are pushing them to adapt and, and I think that perspective is not good for sustainability. They, they need to understand that it's a shared responsibility. And I'm hoping that the, the grants uh, that, that, that uh, Professor Jim Lee is holding would help us to push this agenda and, and cause a change in mindset in our NMCPs that will allow them to, to begin to appreciate and, 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 and take interest in technical skills that are relevant for their understanding of the data. So in, in, in my view, in Africa, what are the challenges? Uh, uh, several platforms uh, are, are now being introduced in, in, in Africa. Key among these is, is the, the MySeq that uh, we are using to uh, operationalize the Amplic Consequence in Toolkit in Ghana and in Mali and other places. Um, it's quite a daunting uh, task to, to have maintenance uh, uh, contracts for these, these machines. Region procurement, to say the least, is, is completely uh, 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 a ripoff for us as scientists because we, we pay an order of magnitude uh, much higher for our regions and we have to wait for a very long time to receive them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bottleneck for, for GSM in Africa that needs to be addressed. And the, the capacity to um, understand the data is something that is building up slowly uh, across our continent. Uh, surely, uh, I believe uh, going forward, GSM uh, activities would, would lead to an increased critical mass of people across Africa who have, who have a knowledge of, 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 of the data and can translate this to uh, products that the NMCPs would uh, appreciate and, 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 and find useful for their day-to-day -day decisions. Unfortunately, we have poor infrastructure in terms of uh, uh, competing for data storage and processing. There are not many places where there are, there are servers that can, can, we can use to uh, run this data and, and internet bandwidth is a problem. There's power instability. I mean, there are quite a number of things that are, are challenging for our environment, but they are, they are not uh, in any way unsurmountable. The, uh, over the, the last uh, three years, we have uh, improved our infrastructure. We have uh, particularly, you know, taken note of these and, and, and worked towards, uh, you know, creating the right environment to allow GSM via the Amplicon 2K to work. And um, I am pretty confident that uh, we will begin to generate data very soon. And, and, and uh, that would be exemplary for other African countries uh, to follow. The Gambia is, is, is doing the same thing. They are in a much better position than we are uh, to, to deal with these challenges. And I'm sure we, will, we would have knowledge generated from there that we can share across our, our GSM partners and understand how to handle these challenges uh, going forward. And so to conclude, uh, there is an opportunity for the NMCP to grab. Uh, GSM is, 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 is come to stay and there are clear benefits for doing GSM in Africa. Uh, if there's nothing at all that we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, uh, given GSM a, a lot of momentum. Molecular surveillance is now uh, a key word even among politicians and I think uh, the NMCP need to, to seize the opportunity uh, to, to work with scientists and make GSM a reality and a, a practicality on the ground. Capacity exists for this to be done and there's a need to improve it across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, we, we, we cannot de develop processes and, and, and uh, uh, means to do pandemic surveillance when there's a need, and then we ignore endemic surveillance. The problem is we need a complementary approach to ensuring that these are given attention uh, uh, where there is a need uh, uh, in any country in, in Africa here. Uh, we would need to, to have the same attention that, that was given to, to, to COVID to, 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 to be applied to malaria and other endemic diseases. And, and we can have a surveillance system that is sustained to handle uh, all uh, scenarios of, of pathogen behavior in our continent. African NMCPs need support. They, they, need, they need real support from donors to be able to, to utilize the data. They need to reorient orient themselves. They need to uh, gain technical understanding of the data. Um, and so that cannot come without cost. It has, to, it, it has cost implications. And I'm glad that uh, some funders are beginning to address uh, this, this issue. Equitable access and to equipment and reagents, as I mentioned, is important. Uh, I don't know how this is going to happen, but uh, we we need to take steps to ensure that you no, know, there's equitable access to reagents in particular to allow GSM to be sustainable in our continent. Uh, sorry, uh, a bit of that. So uh, I'd like to 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 end here and uh, highlight some of our funders, uh, particularly the National Institute of uh, Institute of Health UK, who are uh, sponsoring us they are giving us money to to build infrastructure and allow gsm to work in ghana and the gambia and, uh, and hopefully our story would would be uh, something that can be expanded to include other african countries and of course um, uh, mali is poised to to to, to take on uh, uh, this task and of course other uh, countries in central africa that are, are key to adapting this technology and, 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 and we can have a drive from west, central to east to ensure that this works. We thank our Malaysian partners. Uh, we thank the Welcome Trust and uh, the UK Aid for uh, their being uh, supporting our lab. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I'll drop it here. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas, for this great and very comprehensive uh, uh, talk about, uh, about uh, surveillance in, in Africa. Um, I, I should just add a shout here for uh, another partner in, in Africa. Um, there's in the Congo, we have uh, um, the, the, the Kimoru um, site who are, um, and, and uh, Dr. Katerina Fanello is, is uh, uh, in this call, uh, and they are, um, they, they, they are they're currently um, running a study to use uh, on whether um, uh, a cohort of uh, pregnant women presenting at uh, maternity clinics can be used as a as a surrogate for uh, uh, for doing surveillance uh, instead of using small children, which of course are a more problematic population. So, and uh, and what we are hoping is that we'll be able to. To move forward with implementing in that country also, and um, what what I found was uh, was uh, encouraging is to see that um, many of the issues that you discuss there, such as uh, uh, capacity building, training, empowering the national malaria control programs to better um, receive the data and better interpret it are common themes. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to solve these things together, maybe by some joint uh, training and, and so on. So I, um, I'm, I'm sort of putting that out there for discussion later. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, we got one more talk uh, here from, um, from Sarah Auburn. So we'll, I think we will go straight to that and, and leave questions for, for later. So Sarah, unfortunately, is unable to join us live. She's, uh, she's on an airplane right now, I believe. 
but uh, she's going to talk about the genetic surveillance of plasmodium vivax which of course we haven't really touched very much on in uh, in the previous talks so and after this we'll open up for some more questions Thank you very much to the Genray Mekong organizers for the invitation to present at this meeting. Um, and please accept my apologies that I couldn't present live. Um, I'm very excited to present because um, this is a really great opportunity for me to give you an overview of some new tools that we're developing within the Vivax Gen Network um, for the molecular surveillance of Vivax. And I'm really interested to hear the thoughts from this specific audience on how we can improve upon some of those tools that I'm going to show you to make sure they're really meeting your use case needs in the Mekong region. So I'm going to start with um, an introduction of, of VivexGen. What is VivexGen? Um, so this is the, the Vivex Genomic Epidemiology Network, and it's essentially a network of partners from a range of Vivex endemic countries who have the shared interest in the generation and implementation of molecular surveillance tools to support the control and ultimately the elimination of Vivex. So this network was um, somewhat spearheaded by work that we were doing in Atmen and the Vivex Working Group, where we saw this need for more innovative new tools to address this rising um, challenge of this rising proportion of Vivex cases in many Asia Pacific um, countries. So I just wanted to point out that these surveillance tools that we're developing, the molecular ones, are not meant to replace the traditional tools we use, like microscopy and RDTs, which are clearly really important. Rather, just as in the Genray framework, they're meant to complement those tools, so to give an extra layer of information about how the parasites are evolving, for example, new forms of drug resistance. And I also just wanted to say that we are trying not to reinvent the wheel with VivexGen. Rather, it's intentionally aligned closely with MalariaGen and Genray Mekong um, to form somewhat of a sister program um, that focuses um, specifically on Vivex. So the idea is that we can use the same framework that you use for Genray Mekong um, to implement the Vivex tools that we're developing. So the same ideas that you have the control program who identify key use cases, detect regions where surveillance is needed as a priority, have dried blood spot sampling, processing in a central reference laboratory with genotyping using very similar tools, such as the Illumina Amplicon sequencing assays, and then analysis of data and importantly feedback to control programs in an actionable way, such as these genetic report cards that, that I think many of you will be quite familiar with. So in terms of use cases, the programmatic needs that have been identified, um, at least by our partners in the Outman Vivex Working Group, are actually not too different from those that are, are really nicely mapped out here in this slide that I borrowed from Oliver, um, outlining program use cases for Genray. So for Vivex, again, of course, also very important to be able to select antimalarial um, drug policy, not just liver blood stage, but also liver. Um, to monitor treatment efficacy and resistance, characterize outbreaks, stratify interventions, and evaluate their, the effects of those interventions. In terms of the genetic methods needed to meet those program requirements, um, some of them are pretty clear cut. So it's very clear that we need, of course, effective drug resistance markers to be able to detect um, drug resistance. We need good fingerprinting markers. Um, so those are markers that can distinguish um, accurately one infection from an independent one to be able to characterize, for example, um, recurrent infections. To also be able to determine when you have resistance, whether or not you have one predominant strain causing the resistance or multiple different lineages. And then there are a few other use cases that um, are perhaps still a bit more technical. Um, but I've decided to just give a brief overview of them here, even though we need some more methods development, just because down the line, I think they will be very useful. So these might include using um, those same fingerprinting markers I mentioned to assess, for example, transmission intensity. And you might imagine how this could be useful, for example, to look um, for evidence of transmission reduction before and after an intervention is applied. They can inform on changes in the population structure, as you can again see here, that you might um, start to see after an intervention has been applied. 
or changes such as the, um, uh, the expansion of a particular clone, so an outbreak type clone. And they can also inform on um, gene flow. So you might imagine here, for example, as shown in this picture, if you imagine one of these populations had drug resistance, um, you might be keen to know what is the risk of spread to neighboring populations. And these fingerprinting markers could inform on that. And lastly, uh, with appropriate geographic markers, we can also inform on imported infections. And I'll describe some of the methods we're using in um, later slides. So I wanted to first point out that, of course, there is an existing panel of markers that is being used by spot malaria for genotyping. Um, so this does include some resistance candidates um, and fingerprinting markers, as well as some species confirmation markers. And what we're trying to do in ViVexGen is to um, expand upon these markers to add extra utilities where we can. So I'm going to start with what we're doing in the frame of drug resistance. So as many of you will know, partly owing to the very complex biology of vivax, particularly that, that liver stage, whilst there are several candidate markers that have been associated with resistance to various antimalarial drugs um, highlighted here, most of these are strictly speaking not validated. And this is a particular problem for chloroquine, which as many of you know, is still being widely used as a first line treatment in many countries. So, I can certainly say, if we look at these markers that I've um, highlighted here, that in studies that we've conducted in various Vivexgen partner sites, we have not found association of these markers with um, chloroquine resistance. And that includes studies in areas with high-grade resistance, such as Papua Indonesia and Malaysia. So I think as a clear priority, we need more effective markers. So we are doing work within Vivexgen to try to find those markers. Um, and these include uh, genome-wide association studies. So for these genome-wide association studies, um, we are conducting genomic analyses in Vivexgen partner sites where we have robust clinical uh, and ex vivo chloroquine phenotypes. So those are in uh, sites such as Papua, Thailand, Malaysia, and Ethiopia. And um, in terms of the genomic data, we've had a few um, challenges in getting good quality genomes, but we're working with partners at Sanger and other sites to try to overcome those challenges. And we're really hopeful that we'll be able to get good markers in the coming year or so. We've also done some work on mefloquine surveillance tools. So by chance, we happened to discover um, multiple copies of this gene called PMV PVMDR1. Um, in Thailand in, during a period when methoquine was actually being used for treating um, the co-endemic falciparum population. And many of you all know that MDR1 duplication in falciparum uh, has been associated with methoquine resistance. What was interesting about these Vivax isolates in Thailand with this, the duplication of this gene here, MDR1, is that they all had the same, what we call breakpoints. So the same region was duplicated. Um, I know that's a bit technical, but really the take home message here is that because it was the same, we could develop very simple PCR gel based detection assays to determine when an infection had this duplication. And we actually typed that assay on over 200 samples from the Thai Myanmar border region, and we could show that after mefloquine use was discontinued, the duplication um, dropped very quickly. So, potentially a very useful marker. But we haven't seen this specific breakpoint in regions outside of the Thai Myanmar border. So we're interested to know your views on whether this is one that we should include in our panels. So staying on that theme of treatment, we've also been working on developing fingerprinting markers that can help with characterizing clinical recurrences. So this is really looking to improve the distinction of relapses from recrudescence and reinfection events in, as I say, clinical surveys or in cohorts. So at the moment, as many of you all know, PCR correction approaches simply determine if your day naught and your recurrent infections have the same, genetically the same, or genetically different strains. But that doesn't really give us the full picture for Vivax because, of course, relapses can be either same or different. So what we're doing in Vivax Gen is trying to bring in a combination of genetic data 
and modeling methods that will help us to better determine whether day and autumn recurrent infections are likely essentially to have come from the same mosquito bite. So the assumption here is that parasites that are in the same mosquito bite or the same inoculum have the same parents and therefore, even if they're genetically not identical, they should still have relatedness like we have with sisters or brothers. So where we see day naught and recurrent infections that are not genetically identical, but have this familial relationship like siblings, we can now more confidently rule out that they were reinfections. So I should say it is still tricky to distinguish um, the origin of infections day and recurrent infections that are identical, but we can use clevering models such as um, this one described by Amy and Taylor and colleagues with time to event information to resolve those. So what markers do we need to accurately determine those relationship patterns I mentioned? Well, luckily, when we started the study, this paper by Amy Taylor and her colleagues had been put out, which showed us that modeling suggests we need about 100 multi-allelic fingerprinting markers. Um, so about 100 markers um, gives us low error rates. And so the key message here is that the 38 fingerprinting markers that we currently have for spot malaria wouldn't be sufficient. So we set out to identify a new set of markers, and this was a collaboration with Dr. Sasha Siegel from the Sanger Institute and others from the Sanger where we set out to select a panel of 100 multi-allelic markers across the Vivex genome that could be used in any global region and could be genotyped using those same Illumina methods that are currently used by the Genre Mekong project. And we call these markers microhaplotypes. So microhaplotypes are basically short regions where you capture not just one, but many variants. And that gives us a lot of information at each locus. You can see here with just one locus, now, as we add in more loci, you can see we get a lot of genetic information and you can just imagine what 100 microhaplotypes would look like. And so we could show using Amy's model that with all of this rich information from the microhaplotypes, as shown in this example from Southeast Asia, we observe relatively low error rates when we try to um, estimate the relatedness of pairs of day naught and recurrent infections with 100 microhaplotypes. And um, you don't need to worry too much about these figures, but ultimately the error rates here are all below, are mostly below 10%, similar to what was predicted. And the, really the key take home message here is that we can have much more confident recurrence classification using data at these markers and appropriate models to help to resolve what was previously a confusing situation about um, the origin of recurrence. And that's going to be really informative for um, interpreting clinical surveys and cohorts. So because the microhaplotypes um, fingerprint Vivex infections so well, aside from their utility for characterizing recurrences, they have a whole range of other utilities. And um, I won't go into detail in those, but just wanted to highlight one because we have some nice data on this, which is the utility in characterizing outbreaks. So um, as I mentioned, in a, a few years ago, we generated some lovely genomic data um, from a Malaysian Vivax population. And this was during a period when we saw this large outbreak of essentially clonal identical infections in 2014. And what was nice is we could see that when we just look at the 100 microhaplotypes, not the whole genome, we can capture this outbreak still very nicely. And we have in purple even some new infections that weren't previously characterized with genomic data, and we can very easily see which ones are part of that outbreak. And we can also see other forms of structure that I won't go into detail in, but I can say may be useful for um, better understanding um, transmission in, in different regions. But we do appreciate that um, further methods development is needed to make sure that these sorts of analyses are going to be actionable for control programs. Although we didn't select those microhaplotypes to be um, specifically useful for capturing geographic information, um, we do actually see that they do capture some of that information quite well. And over here, what I've got is a, what we call a principal component plot. 
um, which is basically showing us, using the microhaplotype data, this lovely spread of um, infections by geographic region. So you can see South American infections separating from Africa and Western Asia, South and East Asia here, um, and Oceania over here. So they do have some utility to assign at least regional geographic origin. And we may have a closer look at that and we may find that they have even higher resolution at country or possibly lower um, levels. But again, we do appreciate that this sort of information, this presentation method may not be so actionable to control programs. And on that note, my colleague Anto um, over here has been working very hard to try and develop analytical tools um, that can be reported back to control programs in a more objective and hopefully easier to interpret um, way. And so I don't want to go into too much detail on the methods, but if you are interested, you can find out more in our preprint, um, and here's the DOI. Essentially, what Anto has created is an online platform we call Vivex Gen Geo that uses a likelihood classifier approach to analyze genotyping data against a reference data set and determine what is the most likely geographic origin of an infection. So, what one can do is take the genotyping data you might get from your genetic report card, for example, copy that into this online classifier, run it, and you get an output similar to this, which basically tells you for each sample, what is the most likely country of origin? Um, and also we get the second and third predictions. And what you might see if you had an imported infection is something similar to this um, dummy example where here we've simulated a Thai sample that actually looks like it's come from Papua New Guinea. So the tools currently classify data on the 38 SNP panel, so the, the one that's currently being used by Spot Malaria, as well as um, a new panel that we pulled together. So with 33 SNPs that we've specifically optimized to be good at distinguishing different countries. And we've also made um, Illumina assays, so the same genotyping platform used by Genray Mekong, um, in collaboration with partners from Antwerp University for these new 33 SNPs. Um, and I should say that for the analysis, we can always add other panels as needed. One question we have is that the current analysis in Vivex Gen, Gen, Vivex Gen Geo discriminates by country but we know in some settings that may not be quite so useful. So for example, somewhere like the Thai Myanmar border, move, border region, you may have a lot of movement and the parasites may, very, may be very similar. So country distinctions may not be so useful in that area. And we're really interested to hear if there are more useful boundaries that we can apply to, to our models. So to summarize, for routine surveillance purposes, as in um, the Genray Mekong framework, where you have patients sampling at a single time point, there are currently high throughput assays for drug resistance, such as SP, and we could generate new mefloquine assays for the Thai gene duplication if there's interest, but we clearly have a need for new markers for chloroquine resistance as a priority. We have a couple of fingerprinting markers, but the 100 microhaplotypes will be um, perhaps the most informative for monitoring spatial and temporal transmission, as we've shown although analytical methods developments uh, are needed. There is a marker panel that we've optimized for country level classification of imported cases um, and high throughput genotyping assays for them. And we mentioned the microhaplotypes may also have utility here, but um, we do have that interest in you know, whether and how we should revise the classification of boundaries there. And then um, for those settings where you have both day naught and recurrent infections, such as clinical surveys and cohorts, we've shown that these 100 microhaplotypes, um, when applied to models such as the recurrence models of Amy, um, will have this real utility um, in characterizing recurrences to inform on liver and blood stage treatments. So on that note, um, I'd like to acknowledge a huge number of people who've made really important contributions to the VivexGen work. Um, I haven't been able to, to name all of them here, but I'd just like to highlight those in red. Um, and as I say, just a huge thanks to everyone in the VivexGen network who's made these important contributions, and of course to the funders. And thank you for your time.
<clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much to Sarah. Um, she's, uh, she's been a very precious collaborator of our project. And I think moving forward, uh, we will be working with, uh, with her and, uh, and, and others on uh, extending the capabilities uh, of our Vivax uh, work. So what you've heard here is, um, is basically work that we've been involved in and that we hope to transfer to, uh, to the Mekong region as, uh, a, a, as soon as possible. Now, um, we, have, we have delayed a bit um, here, uh, but there are a couple of questions uh, that, uh, um, that have been put uh, here for, for Lucas. Uh, before that, um, I, Dr. Siv, you want to say something? Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Ilivo, thank you. Uh, uh, the, the speaker, a very nice presentation, uh, especially for Viva. I'm, I'm not clear understanding or capture one point about PVMDR1. Um, what is it the PVMDR1 copy number? It, it, it linked to that has been detected in Thailand. Um, this is a, a link to the monotherapy of uh, mefloquine or or, or different from our MDR1 copy number. And, and the, the second point, I'm very interesting to hear that this is a very interesting knowledge that should be transferred to the Samico region as soon as possible because we as has a mandate to eliminate PV soon in the country. Especially, I, I see that the, the use of epidemiology technology to detect a relapse, recurrence, and also uh, mapping the geographical origin. This is, this is a very is a informative that the country one. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Those are very, um, very important, very encouraging comments. Uh, it, this has actually been our thinking that we, we need to, we need to uh, implement all these things, uh, um, you know, it, relatively uh, soon. Um, I, I should just mention, by the way, that there are good reasons why um, Vivax um, uh, surveillance development has been slower than falciparum. Uh, unfortunately, Vivax is a more difficult uh, parasite to study in the lab because, uh, uh, because it is difficult to culture, it's impossible to culture basically. And, uh, and it's more difficult to find uh, the markers of resistance. Concerning MDR1, uh, I think, um, I, I think um, that uh, Sarah will have to answer the question on, on, um, on, what, uh, on, on how these parasites were exposed to, to mefloquine. Uh, but it was really only based on observation in, uh, on the Thai-Burmese border. So I, I, I don't believe we have any data on uh, uh, MDR1 copy numbers in Vivax um, uh, for, for the Eastern part of the Mekong region. But uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, get an answer to this question and, uh, and communicate it back to you. Now, uh, going back, uh, for a second to uh, Lucas. Uh, Lucas, you have a couple of um, couple of uh, questions or comments from uh, uh, from Sanger Institute here from Roberto. Um, he says, "Thank you for this great eye-opening talk, Lucas. Whole genome and Amplicon are clearly complementary in technologies, but your point about the complexity." is really, really important. Um, how do you think the trade-off between these two approaches should work? Um, would you like to answer that, Lucas? Yes, please. I, I thank you, um, Roberto, for that question. Uh, well, I think uh, um, 
for a, a much wider implementation of uh, GSM in, in Africa. We, I would advocate that we, we go through a more targeted approach like the Amplicon sequencing toolkit or um, the MIPS that other people are, are doing. But uh, as you said, it's, it's, it's a complementary approach. And so uh, we will still need to, to uh, build upon uh, the, the, the targeted sequencing with, uh, with, with whole genome sequencing where we take uh, advantage of, of knowing, uh, um, increasing the breadth of the data to be able to uh, answer some of the population level uh, questions that, that will become increasingly important as uh, we drive down malaria transmission across the continent. Thank you. If I could just add one comment to that, um, I actually, uh, our team, uh, when investigating the outbreak in Laos, found it very useful to be able to, um, to do initial uh, analysis using amplicon sequencing, using genetic barcodes, in order to um, sort of understand and characterize the, the problem. Uh, and then we were able to dig in a lot deeper with uh, whole genome sequencing, for instance, looking at the ancestry of these uh, R, uh, R539T um, mutants that have caused the outbreak. So I, I think I, I think I, I see a, a really great um, motivation for actually implementing uh, different technologies. Uh, you know, one doesn't replace the other. Um, but of course, it is a big problem. How do we make it accessible to, to everybody? And right now, I think we're going, we have to go for a while in relatively small steps because the first the first task is really to make um, the, even the, the relatively simpler methods accessible, more accessible to the countries, because right now it is still dif quite difficult to use the data, even the genetic report cards, even the sort of more, uh, more simplified data that we can get from Amplicon sequencing. We really have to work on training and focus on how to empower the control programs and the scientific partners to make full use of these. And then I think we'll be able to approach the, the, the whole genome sequencing. Uh, Richard Pearson um, is, also, is asking a, another question to Lucas, which I suspect is somewhat related here. He says, what do you think is the key to increasing the data analysis capacity in Africa? Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I think the key, in, in my view, is um, is hands-on training. Um, it's is more targeted training that people who are generating uh, data and can train and engage their data would be, I, in my view, in a better position to understand and 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 use the skills. The, the, over the years, I've learned that people do training and go back and they, they, they lose their skills because they, they, they don't have data to engage. But when there's data being produced and there's capacity building, data analysis skills are being uh, transferred, then I can foresee a situation where the, the, the skills are being built and, and honed in a way that you know, there's immediate value for, for the skills and, and, and they, they, they can be a trainer of trainers. And so you, you get a lot more people benefiting from one person uh, gaining key knowledge and, and uh, using the opportunity that exists within uh, his, his, his space to, to, to and with the presence of data to, to be able to, to train other people. So my take is, is, is that th these cannot be done on, on a theoretical level. This cannot be done in a situation where there's a one-off training and, and, and people are asked to, to, to get up and, 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 and hone those skills. No, we have to do this in the context of data availability, a context of uh, progressive and continuous buildup in, in people's capacity. Thank you. 
Um, Lucas, I think that's incredibly valuable insight. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I think, um, I mean, I think you've crystallized some of the things that we have been uh, really thinking about uh, doing some training. Uh, you know, that it has to be accompanied by data, it has to be accompanied by real problems uh, that can be practiced upon. There's a question uh, here from Sasha is uh, on something different. She's, uh, she's asking um, whether the, the um, uh, whole genome sequence data for the vector um, uh, insecticide resistance surveillance, whether it's enough to begin implementing targeted approaches or are our known markers for insecticide resistance not mature enough yet? What's your thinking? Well, my, my, my thinking is, um, as, we, as we, we, we've said previously for Plasmodium, it's the same uh, approach for, uh, for the mosquitoes. The whole genome sequencing and the target approaches are complementary. But the two key, I mean, getting the markers that, 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 that target uh, genes in, in the mosquitoes that have been uh, 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 sort of phenotype for, for you to, to, to know for sure that they, they correlate with a specific resistance to a specific class of compounds uh, still is a bit of a gray area. It, we, we, we need to, 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 first of all, generate data that validates uh, all the SNPs that we see, say, in the VGSC gene and, and gather the kind of uh, uh, phenotypic understanding of how these, the, uh, uh, these mutations translate to resistance and then build uh, uh, targeted panels that can capture these uh, mutations and, and, and generate data that we can use to monitor while still uh, 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 doing whole genome uh, 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 sequencing for, for uh, mosquitoes, vector mosquitoes to understand uh, in, in greater detail, uh, you know, the, the population level statistics and also so, um, uh, just general diversity and selection uh, as it happens uh, in other genomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could follow up for a minute with a comment on insecticide resistance. So um, in uh, in Africa, of course, the insecticide resistance surveillance has uh, um, has made more progress than here. We haven't um, we haven't implemented this in uh, in the Greater Mekong sub region uh, for for a number of reasons, but primarily because uh, there's really not enough that is known about markers of insecticide resistance in the vectors that are present in this region. So. Uh, it, there would need to be a lot of work um, to do this. The, the, the African vectors are a lot better characterized in that way. But what I wanted to know from the, um, from the MNCPs here um, is, um, it, you know, would there be um, much interest in genetic surveillance of insecticide resistance in Southeast Asia? Um, Dr. Olivo, um, can can I? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, uh, for Cambodia, the, it is a very important because you know, um, currently when when malaria has been the decreasing, and the uh, the bound the boundary of of the, the infection also uh, stringing. It means that the uh, um we 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 had to to collect the anopheles. And to uh, to do the routine insecticide resistant app uh, routine, so I think that epidemiology um, uh, um, the 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 our, our work that has been uh, shown in the presentation in Africa also the quite also important in South East Asia as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that's uh, very good. Um, Dr. Quang, do you agree uh, in Vietnam, would that be valuable also? Okay, we may have lost the audio there. Um, 
Dr. Keo, would you like to uh, comment on that? Uh, yes, for insecticide, civilian, yes, really important and useful for uh, us because we, before we go to the eliminate, we, we want to know the dead area and to compare the uh, civilian drug resistance also. This is, uh, we, we, we need to do the uh, burden area in the burden area. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I believe um, we have, uh, we have sort of, we have, uh, um, we don't have so much more uh, time available. So I, I think uh, the best, I mean, we, we had a little session planned here on, on some future of genetic surveillance. Uh, I think we will, uh, take that offline and uh, and uh, um, discuss it uh, in some other forum. Uh, I would like to just um, to draw the meeting to a, to a close here. We've had wonderful presentation and a, and a great variety of perspectives, uh, not only from from the countries, from uh, from the control programs, but also from uh, uh, the sort of technical perspectives from, uh, um, you know, uh, people who work on Vivax and people who work in Africa. And um, I think for me, it has been very valuable in terms of uh, uh, understanding some of our priorities as we move forward. Um, I get a very clear message that, um, if we if we move on with uh, um, with training and with better communications and better tools, this will be of great impact uh, for our partners. And so this is a clear message we received. And and then there's a lot of sort of smaller messages that uh, um, that, that that are also very important. So I would like to thank very much. Um, our, uh, our all our attendees, our partners, uh, our public health uh, um, representatives, uh, Dr. Siv, Dr. Quang, Dr. Keo, who have been uh, so uh, patiently and helpfully supporting us not only today but over the last uh, for the last few years, and um, and with this. I will, uh, you know, uh, I, um, I, I will close the meeting again, thanking everybody very much and thanking my team here for having organized this, uh, which was actually technically quite a challenge for a bunch of uh, malaria scientists. Okay, thank you very much and goodbye until the next time.